thank you for attending today's discussion on the recent Department of Labor's guidance around cybersecurity, specifically around keeping participant PII safe in 2022. PBI is pleased to host this event in partnership with Groom Law and continue our webinar series on industry's challenges and solutions. Before I introduce our presenters, just a, again, a couple of uh, points of housekeeping. Everyone has been placed on mute. Um, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask the presenters, uh, please do so using the chat feature, uh, which is in the webinar um, uh, side panel. My name is Mike Scoville. I'm the National Director of Sales at PBI Research Services. PBI is an organization that's been around uh, helping uh, pension plans, in, uh, insurance companies, uh, defined contribution plans for over 40 years, locating missing participants, helping with uncast checks, as well as uh, death audit solutions. Joining me today is uh, Corey Cates and Michael Kreps. Corey Cates is the Chief Information Officer at PBI Research Services. Corey is responsible for technology and analytics and is a quantitative technologist with a wealth of experience. Prior to joining the firm, Corey worked at Credit Suisse for eight years, including several years as head of technology for the Longevity Markets Group. Corey earned a PhD in plasma physics from the Department of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics at Columbia University. Also with me today is Michael Kreps. Michael specializes in issues relating to public policy, fiduciary responsibilities, and planned funding and restructuring. He routinely presents uh, or represents both private and public sector clients before federal agencies and Congress. Previously, Michael served as a senior pensions and employment counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions from the 110th through the 114th Congress. Our discussion today will cover three main topics. Uh, number one is the best practice in cybersecurity. Number two is really the DOL guidance um, that impacts those uh, best practices and then changes um, we see and anticipate seeing in 2022. Again, as mentioned, as time per permits, we'll work through questions which were submitted prior to this call, as well as during this webinar. And, it, and uh, really at this time, let me turn it over to Michael Krups uh, with Groom Law. Michael. Thanks, and good to talk with everyone today. Um, looking forward to this discussion, um, and I'll encourage you to ask questions if you, if you have them. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some of the significant changes surrounding the guidance related to cybersecurity. And, you know, I think this is a, an evolving topic. So what I say today may be stale in, in six months, but at least for now, uh, let me, I'll give you kind of the lay of the land and then we can have further discussion about it. Um, as most of you probably are aware, that there's a, a pretty comprehensive regulatory framework that governs private sector retirement plans, both defined contribution and defined benefit, as well as health. Um, it's a law called the Employee Retire Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And you know, when, when ERISA was passed in 1974, cybersecurity wasn't, wasn't an issue, wasn't on anyone's radar. And, and so as it has become an issue, uh, we've been struggling, I think the whole regulated community has been struggling to try and figure out exactly what ERISA means for cybersecurity. What are employers responsible for? What are fiduciaries responsible for when it comes to uh, protecting participant data, uh, you know, preventing breaches, preventing theft? And, you know, the truth is that it, it's not 100% clear. ERISA generally imposes a, a pretty robust set of standards on people who manage retirement plans. Uh, a, a fiduciary standard of care is the most important component of that. And it says you have to be prudent when you, uh, when you manage uh, plan assets, meaning you know, the things owned by the plan. And so the question is, does that fiduciary standard of care apply when you're managing uh, plan data? Is plan data a plan asset? And if so, what do you have to do to demonstrate prudence? You can imagine a situation if you kind of think about it where an employer does everything right, where a service provider does everything right, where a participant does everything right, yet theft still occurs, there's, data, there's still a data breach or there's still a problem, uh, and who's responsible for that? You know, who, who's gonna plug that gap um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of not a lot of certainty at, on that point quite yet. 
the regulators recognize that, I think. Uh, they get the challenge here, and they're starting to, to play a bit of catch up, uh, trying to be proactive. But it, it's tough in a wor world that's constantly, uh, constantly changing. Um, so, you know, what we typically um, have advised uh, plan fiduciaries is that, you know, overall, overall, although ERISA is silent um, and for public plans, there, there's mostly, they mostly follow ERISA or have laws that are similar to ERISA, we have to just act like we always would. We have to be prudent and we should, as a best practice, pay attention to the Department of Labor's guidance on this subject. Now, there's not a not a lot of guidance. Uh, the first piece of guidance that we usually take a look at is the e-delivery or the e-disclosure regulation issued in 2020. So about two years ago, the Department of Labor issued a regulation that was intended to facilitate uh, electronic delivery to participants, you know, statements, fee disclosures, things like that. And in a, a small part of that, the, the guidance says that a fiduciary has to take measures reasonably calculated to protect the confidential confidentiality of personal information. This is the Department of Labor starting to recognize that, um, that, that fiduciaries have a responsibility with respect to the protection of participant data and kind of extending um, this concept of protecting the security and privacy of participants to, to not just their, their account, but also their data, their information, putting some value there. Um, that was followed up about a year later by a fairly comprehensive set of, of guidance documents by the department that I'll talk about in a little more detail in a sec. But there were there were three different documents, and they were they were put out as as tip sheets or best practices. Um, they're not actually law, so I, I want I want to make sure people understand that these are just kind of best practices put out by the department to guide fiduciaries. Uh, but they do seem to indicate what the department believes are minimum expectations for fiduciaries as they as they endeavor to protect participant data. And I, I think the the most notable point is the department explicitly recognize recognizes or or maybe even creates a duty to mitigate cybersecurity risk uh, for fiduciaries. That is explicit. And it's fairly consistent with what they said the year prior in the context of electronic delivery. So let's kind of tick through the, the guidance documents we have from the Department of Labor. The first one is a, a tip sheet for hiring providers. So this one was geared towards um, towards uh, employers and, and it gave them a, a framework for what to consider when uh, looking at and diligencing uh, service providers, contracting tips and things like that. The second one was a cybersecurity best practices document that was geared towards record keepers in particular, but other service providers too. And it has uh, 12 points best practice, uh, 12 points of best practices for the, the service providers. And, and is uh, basically a, a what's what of, of what DOL would expect to see during an investigation or, an, or review. And the third document is really for participants. And this is, uh, this is one of those things that could impact litigation, but it, 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 it kind of puts out there what participants should think of in protecting their own accounts. And, you know, I think a lot of that's the things in there are self-evident. You can, I'll, you all can read them for yourself, for yourselves and get into the details, but they are somewhat self-evident. I, I'm not sure there's a ton of guidance in there. And again, I, the big thing to come out of these three documents was really the department first, for the first time, affirmatively stating that fiduciaries have a duty to mitigate cybersecurity risk. I'll just quickly note that there are some state laws too that have been popping up all over the place that may be applicable to public and private sector plans. You know how you respond to uh, to data breaches. Those are more and more common as states have grappled with this issue as well. We don't have time to go into those today, but they exist and they they're they're fairly important. So. Let me just close this out by by talking a bit about litigation because I I know that's the where kind of the rubber meets the road. ERISA's primary enforcement mechanism, or the way we we oversee and enforce the fiduciary standards, is through 
um, the Department of Labor and through private sector litigation, private plaintiff litigation. Um, and there's already been some litigation about cybersecurity. They're generally styled as fiduciary breach claims against the employer and or the service providers, claiming that um, claiming that the employer or the service provider uh, breached his or her duty to protect the data. Uh, the big issue here is one I, I hinted at or maybe called out a little bit at the top, and that's this issue of whether uh, the data associated with the plan is really a plan asset. And as I mentioned, that matters because, um, because ERISA's fiduciary duties only apply to the management of plan data, or, or I'm sorry, plan assets. And so to the extent plan data is not a plan asset, then you don't have any duties with respect to it, at least not any ERISA duties. There have been a couple decisions on this. So far, courts, without much analysis, have seemed to be concluding that, that uh, plan data is not a plan asset, which is um, a, kind of an odd result. But um, and I and I don't necessarily think the Department of Labor would agree with that. However, that's where the courts have been trending. Um, the other big issue here, and I flagged this one too, is just what happens when when nobody does anything wrong, right? What happens if every the service provider followed the contract to the letter? The employer didn't didn't do anything to facilitate a breach, didn't make any mistakes, vetted everything perfectly per DOL guidelines. Everything was done right, yet data was still stolen. That happens. And to date, in a lot of cases, the service providers have been been making participants whole or cleaning up the messes. And um, in some cases, employers have too, but that that isn't always going to be the case, um, and I don't think we can rely on that 100% going forward. There is a big regulatory gap or maybe a, a, a liability gap here that is worth being cognizant of. So just finally, and to close this out uh, on this legal portion, what do we expect to see? Do we expect to see any changes in the law? Um, as far as we know, the Department of Labor doesn't intend to issue any more guidance in the near future on cybersecurity. We do see some auditing, uh, but that's about it. Um, we, we see some auditing, but that, that's about it. Uh, and there is a the chance, though, however, that Congress and the states will continue to legislate on this. So, you know, just to close this out, you know, I think the big takeaways here are that we've got some guidance under ERISA recognizing a duty for fiduciaries to mitigate the risk, cybersecurity risk, and there's some DOL guidance that provides a useful, um, a useful framework, but it's more likely uh, kind of a, a tool for future enforcement, which we're already seeing starting to ramp up. And the true enforcement arm at this point is through the the, the private litigation. Uh, so, given the risks here, you know, we we do encourage clients to review re review policies, practices, service provider agreements, the whole deal, to ensure that. You know, at least to the to the extent you can, you're being as protective of, of possible of uh, participant data while the law is being resolved. Now, I'll I'll uh, take us into a little bit uh, more detail on the cybersecurity side and what what that looks like and some practical things. And so there's a, there's a couple of ways that I'll do that. So I'm going to take the I'm going to start by taking the tips. For hiring a service provider, one of the documents that Michael referenced, that uh, was was one of the guidance documents, and uh, get into some of the details and spell that out. I actually thought that that guidance from a year ago was was um, pretty pragmatic. That it was it was it was practical and, and a good prioritization of the right things to to focus on and get started with. Um, so. I like it from that aspect and it's a, it's a good starting point. So a couple of things that are in there that what did it say? Uh, so some of the tips for hiring a service provider, is it, it asks, you, you need to know what standards or frameworks your the service provider is using. So, and, and it, as typical guidance, it's not prescriptive. It just says you should check the standards, but so what does that actually mean? A common ones. So, if if somebody is using NIST standards, the the standards and technology, national standards and technology. Uh, if somebody's if a service provider has more of an international bent, they might be using ISO standards. Those are the two most common ones that we we see. There's there's others, uh, but those are kind of the the 
the most common frameworks that are that are standard and comprehensive. One thing that you can do when you're talking to service providers is even those those policies, so ISO or NIST um, frameworks are not necessarily prescriptive either. That they, they will because it, it allows you some freedom to on how you implement your your information security program. So you can you can you can ask for the uh, specific policies and dig into um, if there's portions that you care about. If you want to know exactly how pass you know how strong passwords need to be, then that would be in, in the provider's policies, specific policies, uh, and doesn't isn't necessarily specified just by the framework. So the second piece. So one. Does this, does this service provider have a standard framework that's standard you know, that, that's robust um, and not they're not trying to roll their own and kind of make up their own security standards because that's not a good practice and the to me the biggest differentiator between how mature is an information security program is is what they're doing for third party audits so how are they bringing in a third party to assess their compliance with that that standard and framework so the the U.S. standard is is uh, so SOC two type two would be um, a, a fairly the the U.S. standard. The I, there's an ISO standard two that you can get a certification that you're compliant with the, the ISO uh, frameworks. But one of those things it should be an annual um, check. So um, type two means that they're actually checking the controls. It's not not just that they're checking the the standard of the framework, but they're checking compliance with that framework. Um, so it's important to get those that to me that's that's the biggest differentiator it's if you're going to a, a company and you know they offered you um, either either financials that are are unaudited or audited you would want to see the audited ones where a third party had, had gone over it and and verified it and put their name and and reputation on the line against it and uh, that's what you want to see on on security and and a service provider as well. Uh, in addition to the other third party things that come into play, especially with SAT, uh, software as a service applications, um, is you can you ask for a third party penetration test or or a, sometimes they're called um, you know uh, an application security assessment, but a third party is trying to find uh, vulnerabilities and and you want to make sure that those are addressed. The other thing that was in the Department of Labor guidelines, which to me, so as a security professional are, are secondary. So those are the leading indicators. Are they following the framework and, and compliant with it? Kind of the backup safety net are check because they're not leading indicators, but they're lagging indicators. Have they had a, a breach in the past? Do they have adequate insurance? And then do you have contractual obligations to maintain all these things? So you don't want a situation where They've got good security today, but then they let that lapse over the next year or two or uh, whatever. So contractual obligations to maintain that security framework, to maintain annual audits, to maintain a, a level of insurance, and to notify you of breaches when they occur. But again, I I view those as a safety net. Um, you'd rather you'd rather see that they're they're active, have a solid framework, and are preventing a breach up front rather than um, having contractual rights uh, once that that breach does occur. So those are important, but to me, they're they're lagging rather than leading. Um, I want to shift a little. So that that was on the DLL guidance. I want to shift a little bit to what's coming forwards because this is this is kind of what will come next and some of the things that you'll see. Uh, so also about a year ago, I think it was in May last year, um, there was a an executive order um, from the White House, and it it was mandated several. Uh, federal agencies to implement uh, additional cybersecurity changes and improvements. And part of the stated um, reasoning for that is that they know that when they when they force federal agencies to do things, it will trickle down and, and be because of government contracting and because the government is such a big part of the, the overall industry that it will force compliance and kind of changes down the line into the private sector as well. So it'll take a couple of years for these things to kind of come through and start filtering down but th this is what's th these are some of the things that are coming this this was issued right after um you know the context is that it's it's with with colonial pipeline and solar winds and microsoft all had big 
breaches and vulnerabilities that had high impacts uh, across the nation, across the world. Um, so, so part of it is a, is a reaction to that, and and how do we how do we address those kinds of breaches? So, a couple of things. So, one, it defines secure cloud concepts, and is zero trust networking um, is the kind of buzzword that you might start hearing. The the basic concept is that security used to be uh, uh you know maybe four or five years ago it was, it was dominated by you want to you want to you want security at the edge you want to make a wall you set up a firewall you set up security and scanning and 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 um virus checkers and and things like that at the edge you have you you make it hard for people to get in the gate and then you have an internal network that's secure. So you're dividing the world into my secure internal space and the scary external space. Um, and the, the that concept has been challenged. Those those breaches I mentioned all challenge those. And the mindset has gone from how do we keep the bad guys out to what happens if the bad guys get in? How can we limit it, what they can do? How can we find them quickly? How can we get them out quickly? How can we um, react and respond to that? Uh, so it's almost like the it's taken some time, but the industry has given up on trying to define a wall and a perimeter to keep people out of. And then and it's moved to zero trust is essentially, I'm going to treat every piece of network traffic as if it's scary external net, uh, internet traffic, like it's a stranger on the internet. So I'm going to make them verify themselves, authenticate, encrypt everything. Um, and so it's one of the ways to think of it is that that you're treating even internal traffic as if it's external. Uh, and that 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 makes a big difference because the concept where, oh, I don't have to encrypt this traffic because it's inside my own network um, doesn't make sense because once somebody gets in, then if you then they, they have access to kind of everything so you want it's putting in constant checks and 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 across the entire um network stack in, internal especially um other things that were in there securing the software supply chain so that was an, an important one uh but to me the one part is so the standard playbook for incident response so this is this is the piece where it's it's kind of not if somebody's going to get in but it, it's when how bad is it when they get in so having having better monitoring alerting and then um and then practicing and having a good response when somebody does get in how do i shut up how do i find them shut them down get them out tell the right people um and and remediate the situation so uh those are the, the high level concepts there's obviously specifics in there but those are the, the movements kind of in the industry that you'll start to see uh coming down over time the other thing that 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 does is it the change from kind of a perimeter based view changes the way that people uh, so cloud computing and kind of public clouds has, has challenged that as well it got really messy to define where your perimeter was when that when some of your infrastructure included a, a public cloud like um, amazon or google or microsoft because you've got multiple people on the same servers and so the perimeter is actually uh not clear at all and and gets messy so it it allows for better protection when that perimeter is big and all over the place. Let's go to the next slide. The, the last thing I wanted to just spend a minute on is what do you do practically? So one of and, and I'll hit this really quick. One of the things that you can do practically to to change the way that your um, that your your own cybersecurity stance is to change the mindset that you have on 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 how to protect data so a lot of people have the mindset of we're trying to do our job the most efficiently as possible and get the job done quickly and that is often at the expense of data security and so the mindset needs to be more like a bank teller there's all sorts of things in a bank teller's job that are not convenient uh they don't take out all the cash and put it right next to the next to the desk that they're going to need for the week um they they have regular checks and counts and they they recount and another person counts and the, everything's locked in the vault and two people have to be there when somebody goes in the vault so you need to change your mindset and start viewing this data as if it's it's valuable and um uh, an asset that's important and needs to be locked up and protected 
and sometimes that will come at, at convenience you'll need to act you know having all of uh all of your clients pii in one spot at one time is like leaving the the cash register open and on the on the desk and you don't want to do that you want to be um finding ways to protect things and sometimes that will will be a trade-off between convenience and, and security and that's an important one to start making i'll kick it back to mike for q a maybe Great, thanks, Corey. Yeah, before we jump to Q and A, I, I want to just take just a quick moment. So, as Corey had mentioned and Michael had highlighted as well, there's just a lot of changes with with data security and the risk associated with it. As Corey had also alluded to, sometimes that's at risk of the convenience factor. So, PBI, one of the things that we noticed from our clients and heard repeatedly from our clients is a lot of the actions were project based. So, missing participants due to an uncashed check, an annual funding notice that was returned a death uh, check that uh, may be continuous, maybe a one-time project or data verification. And PBI about um, midpoint last year created CERTA census, which is intended to be more of a proactive solution. The file is managed from start to finish. Um, it's continuously monitored for data updates. So if there's address changes, name changes, if there's a death in the population, if there's return mail or missing check, uh, CERTA census automatically follows a process and defined process to find that individual, um, as well as finding beneficiaries. So if, if somebody has a noted beneficiary, but it's not part of your population, it's an unknown, uh, CERTA Census also proactively does that. All through PBI Secure Network and uh, the, the uh, technology that we've created uh, to protect that data. So PBI is a SOC 2 type 2 uh, audited uh, company. We have defined policies and procedures as well. But be more than happy to discuss that further um, with anyone that is interested. Uh, my contact information um, is on this next slide. But as we wrap up, I want to thank uh, Corey and Michael. And uh, let's see if we can uh, go through just a couple of questions in the time that we have. This first one is for Michael. And that is, what is the required time frame to notify participants if there is a breach of PII? It's a really good question. So every state is a little different here. Uh, it's usually a time period after you should, you know, or reasonably should know that a breach had occurred. It could be anywhere from kind of an unspecified as soon as practical period to 60 days. Uh, you do have to check the state law for where each participant lives. So um, it can be, it can be a bit of a, 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 a challenge to run all that down, but it's usually not a very long uh, window when you're supposed to notify either the participant or the state or both. Great. And then a, the second question, if I switch it to Corey for a moment, Corey, the question is, what do you consider to be the biggest cyber threat to small businesses in the coming year? Yeah, so the, the, um, the, it, it's similar to the current, the current threats. So it tends to be crypto lockers and ransomware and people um often taking advantage of phishing or or getting on a link or a mistake or or leaked credentials and it's it's often not so those are crimes tend to be kind of a, a convenience and and they're looking to not necessarily um sell your data but lock you out of your data and make you pay for your data so that tends to be the dominant um model and those can that can be prevented with things like mfa and and scanning links and files and keeping systems up to date uh, those are the biggest kind of prevent preventative measures that can help with those those kinds of threats all right and michael you addressed this a little bit before but can you highlight a little bit further on uh if an independent it provider uh can be held responsible for not warning a business about an issue like a, a breach or um exposure of, of pii there are notice laws at the state level that require independent uh that require the 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 entity that has experienced the breach to notify affected parties, which, you know, in the case of a retirement plan would be not just the participants, but also the, the employer and the fiduciaries responsible for managing that. So, you know, there's that state law requirement, and then there's often, uh, often contractual liability there as well. And in fact, in those Department of Labor guidelines for contracting with providers, they do discuss this, that you should look at this issue uh, as you enter into service provider agreements. Great. Well, I do want to be conscious of everyone's time. We are at the 30-minute uh, mark. 
I want to extend my appreciation and thanks to Corey Cates and Michael Krebs again for presenting uh, today. And for everyone that has had a uh, participate or attended this webinar, um, we will reach out to those that have questions and, and work with Corey and Michael to answer those questions and get those back to you. Again, if there are any additional questions that you might have, feel free to chat those in and uh, we'll respond to those uh, in kind as well. But thanks again for attending PBI series. Um, look for additional uh, webinars from PBI in the uh, weeks and months to come. And thank you again for your attendance.